everybody. Welcome to another episode of Two Strike Noise, your weekly baseball history podcast. My name's Jeff. I'm one half of the show. The other part, my co-host, Mark A. Johnston. Mark, who's getting more rain, you or me at this point? Well, I tell you what, we had uh, what they call the bomb cyclone, which I'm still not sure what it is, but what about that for a minor league baseball team, the bomb cyclones? <laughs> it's the entire entire West Coast. We're, we're getting bomb cycled as well. Yeah, it's, it's uh, late in the day as we record this. It's 3 p.m. Pacific and it's nice and dark. You know, I remember working Mariners games and driving home at 10 o'clock and it still being I had to drive with, with my lights on. But if I looked to the west, it was still I still saw a blue sure. sky. And then, yeah, yeah, the winter, it's like three o'clock and it's pitch black. Yep. It's bizarre, and I don't know why we do the uh, whole daylight savings. I don't really understand the, the whole thing in itself. I, you know, whatever. It's for the farmers. They used to not have me. lights on their tractors. <laughs> okay. Well, whatever you say, man. All right. Well, uh, let's get into the show here. We've got stuff to discuss for this off-season uh, episode. So let's get right into our BP segment now, Mark. I uh, we've talked about Steve Garvey quite a bit on this show. We've did a whole episode on him. We urged anybody living here in California like myself to not vote for him. And he did not. He was not elected, thankfully. He had no shot. None. <laughs> well, I was still worried because it's Steve Garvey. And my God, the guy is just made for he's like Russell Wilson. So the, the, one of the few NFL players I know, Russell Wilson, when he was in Seattle and I lived there, I thought this guy would be huge in 1980 because he had that squeaky good guy image and he kind of like Gary Carter too. You know how he drove his teammates crazy by always knowing where the camera was and always looking. And that's what yeah. Steve Garvey is. He's one of those guys. But what I did see is I saw a video on uh, the Steve Garvey celebrity bill fishing tournament. Oh, I didn't get invited to that. Well, I'm this sorry. Year. It's the Bill Fish Fishing Tournament. Well, and this happened mm -hmm. in the 80s, so there's probably a reason you didn't get an invite. Oh, yeah. Probably my invitation got lost again. Yeah. So, first of all, <laughs> it's awful. It's just, it's hosted by Steve Garvey, and he's doing exactly what I said. He's doing the kind of slimy, I'm so perfect, hair quaffed. But I also want to address the Bill Fish because that is not a, it's not one of the celebrities. It that is, is actually, is. it's actually what a blue marlin is referred to. Though, through the entire uh, show, they call it a, a marlin or a blue marlin. I don't think they call it a billfish once. So, I'm a little confused about. There's the, no middle name of the, is there like Smokey the Bear? Bill no. The fish? Just bill, a okay. billfish is, I guess, what a marlin is officially called or something. But. Now, no, if Bill Fish, if there was a celebrity named Bill Fish on this, though, they would have been the most famous celebrity to be involved. <laughs> <laughs> that, Big time, huh? Just saying. They introduced, quote unquote, legendary comedian Artie Johnson. Artie Johnson from Match Game? Wow. Uh, I, was he on Match Game? I, I have here, you might remember him from Assault of the Party Nerds 2, the heavy Petting detective. I okay. I don't recall that one, but I think he was in Laughing too. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, Party Nerds Two, the heavy petting detective, is probably where most people know him from, though. I'm, yeah, I, I missed that one. I'm guessing. Uh, also, there was Ron Masick. Who is Ron Masick? You ask. Who's Ron Masick? <laughs> he was the sheriff for Murder She Wrote. <laughs> oh well. So again, oh, Ron. you're using the term celebrity very liberally here also they called him rising comedian michael floorwax <laughs> well he may have risen but uh, he <laughs> flopped now i yeah i think his last name is probably the funniest thing about him but floorwax does have an imdb page with exactly two entries both of which he played self though he did go <laughs> on to apparently a successful morning show host in denver the last quote-unquote celebrity is steve cannelly from Dallas, the TV show. But I oh. think he may be more famous for his role in Pumpkinhead 2, Blood Wings. Oh, Pumpkinhead. Yeah, I didn't see two, though. Yeah, I'm, I don't think a lot of people did. But this this crew of celebrities kind of reminds me of a certain celebrity softball game that was held in T-Mobile Park in, in Seattle some time ago. <laughs> 
Top line, baby. <laughs> but I don't, and I didn't watch enough of this to see who won the tournament, but. Well, that's what matters. I'm going to assume that Garvey tilted it so that he would win regardless, but that's just a guess. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this is an interesting stat. So this is a list of players with at least one stolen base and no caught stealings in a season. Who did it the most in their career? Wow. You want me to guess? Sure. I, you're not going to get these. John Crook. Uh, well, you're along the right train of thought, but no, Crook is not at least in the top 30 that I'm looking at here. Carlton Fisk? Carlton Fisk is another good, I mean, you you know what game I'm playing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but no. But no. Okay. Those are my two guesses. Uh, so number one is Greg Maddox. No kidding. <laughs> he had 10 seasons in which he had at least one stolen base and no caught stealings. Wow. He picked his, uh, picked his opportunity yeah. as well. So, I mean, okay. Greg Maddox, I guess I don't remember ever. See, they had to have been like, you know, busted hit and runs or something, but number two on this list, there's three guys actually tied for number two. Uh, one of which I've never heard of, which is Sherm Lowler played in uh, 1950 through 1962. He did that eight seasons. The other two guys tied with Sherm with eight seasons of one stolen base, at least, and no caught stealings, Russell Brannion and David Ortiz. <laughs> wow, you're right. I wouldn't have got that. <laughs> yeah. Also, uh, following Sherm, we've got Edwin Encarnacion, Paul Canerco, Ramon Hernandez, Phil Nevin, Jeff Conine, I mean, none of these guys you expect to be stealing bases, but let alone have seasons where they at least steal one and don't get caught. These names are just crazy. I, I, That's hilarious. Nelson oh. Cruz is on here. He did it oh, six, nice. six times during his career, as did Oral Hershiser and Jorge Posada. <laughs> Oral was running. Some guys just always have the green light, I guess. I, yes, I'm sure that was it. He just Tommy's like, you go when you want it. <laughs> so, Absolutely. This led me to another list. Who has the most games in their career with a home run and a stolen base? Hmm. So I think the number one guy on this list should be should be somewhat easy to, to come across if you think about it. Would it be Barry Bonds? You you are correct. He did that 102 times, which is uh, number one, and that's 15 times more than the number two guy on the list. Any guesses? Nice. Uh, let me go with Ken Seiko. Uh, no, he is not on this list. Uh, it would be Ricky Henderson. Oh, that makes sense. Some yeah. guy we've talked about. He did it 87 times. He had a home run and a stolen base in a game. And then uh, you jump down to number three, who did it 65 times as A-Rod. And then Bobby Bonds is number four. So number one and number four are Bonds people. Represented by the Bonds family. The Bonds peoples. And then Willie Mays is six, and Barry was, was his godson. So that kind of connects. Interesting. And Ricky Henderson chose 24 with the Yankees to honor Willie Mays. So it's, right. all, yes. it's connecting. It's, it's all in there. And that led me to one more thing, <laughs> because the person who posted that is Christopher Kamka. He is a pretty prolific poster on social media. He does a lot of a lot of baseball stuff. And I don't remember, Mark, if we've talked about this before. I seem to think we have, but I forgot about it. And so this kind of sparked my memory. When we're opening upper deck cards and we get one of those collector's choices where it's artwork of the player. Uh huh. Vernon Wells' father is the artist on some of those. Yeah, Vernon Sr., right? I don't know if it must be. It says was done by Vernon Wells. It doesn't say senior or junior, but we know that yeah. he's got a son named Vernon Wells. I know. I, I mean, I remember because a buddy of mine was, uh, he's an artist as well, and he was always talking about Vernon Wells, his paintings and so on. I, I, yeah, I think we've talked about it, but I just didn't remember it. So... Now I remember. <laughs> okay, last thing here in BP before we get into the main part of the show. Do you know who Mark McGuire got his first hit off of? Jeez, no, I don't. August 26, 1986. So you were in you were in the, the Rainiers or the Tigers, I guess, locker room at this point. It was right? Tigers times, yeah. Yeah. Mark McGuire 
got his first hit off of a guy who, when this pitcher needed to go get a filling, would go to Mark McGuire's dad. (laughs) (laughs) It's Tommy John. No kidding. Tommy John's dentist was Mark McGuire's dad. Wow. You know what? And that's, uh, I think that's like a Kevin Bacon thing. You can get everything back to Mark McGuire's dad by <laughs> like six steps. Yeah. Well, you remember when McGuire came up, he was a third baseman. Yes. He played third for the Tigers. Yeah. For Tacoma Tigers. Yeah. Also, I would mention that Mark McGuire's first major league hit was a single to center field, fielded by none other than number 24 in pinstripes, Ricky Henderson. There you go. Bring it all, bring it all around to Ricky Henderson. Those are just some odd things I pulled from the internet to get us warmed up, BP and and so forth, to get us warmed up for the main part of the show this week, Mark. I have got a guy that we have talked about an antidote that, is it antidote? I thought that's what cured poison. Anecdote. Anecdote. Thank you very much. Yes. We've talked about an anecdote of his that I will mention in the story as well, but he has a lot more to offer. In terms of baseball stats, baseball history, and the kind of stuff that we like to talk about. His name is Gus Weying. W-E-Y-H-I-N-G. Gus was born September 29th, 1866, in no other place than Louisville, Kentucky, which we seem to mention... (laughs) It comes up a lot. A lot, yeah. Interesting thing about Gus... His playing weight is listed as 5'10", 145 pounds. That's uh, that's a small drink of water, I guess is what you would call him. That, by the way, is the same height as Sonny Gray and Billy Wagner, just to put it in perspective of guys that you see today. But they don't weigh, they weigh a bit more than 145 pounds. Right. He also, Gus had a great mustache. He had like a three tenths of a point mustache. If we pulled him in wax packs heroes. Nice. I also think his mustache might have been what Dick Dastardly's mustache was based on. Like it's, it's a full on like Raleigh kind of always had like this, the tight curl on the end. Yeah. Gus had a thick mustache and it really, really curled over. Like it's, if you know who Dick Dastardly is, you know, of what I speak. Yeah, I, I'm more of a Muttley fan, but uh, I do know who Dick Dastardly is. <laughs> isn't, that how, <laughs> isn't that how he laughed? So Gus began his baseball career in 1885 as a right-handed pitcher for the Henley Company team in Richmond, Indiana, where he struck out 17 batters against Cambridge City at the age of 19. He finished the season with a 19-3 and record and uh, immediately had several offers to join the professional ranks of uh, baseball. So to do that, he signed with the Charleston Seagulls, which was an actual baseball team, not just a bird, not just a bunch of birds eating trash by the shore, as the name might imply. Right. But how? Right. We- yeah, that was that's where my mind went immediately. Yeah. How weird would that have been if it's just like a bunch of birds grouped together and signed a baseball player? <laughs> <laughs> that would definitely be weird. Yes. That, I think it's kind of like a, a lesser known idiom than the one with monkeys just hitting random keys on a typewriter for an infinite yes. space of time would eventually complete Shakespeare. Like, I think it's the same thing if you give him enough time. But sure. despite his young age, he was regarded as the best pitcher the league had ever seen. And people were comparing him to show favorite Toad Ramsey. Who oh, Toad. We did an entire episode on way back when. So check it out if you haven't already. Gus would go up against teams like the Atlanta Atlantas. And I'm I'm not making that up. That was the team name, the Atlanta Boy, Atlantas. That took some thought to put that together. Yeah. <laughs> he finished the season with a 13 and 8 record. Not so great, you say, 13 and 8. Uh, but this is why records for pitchers are so overrated and we we talk about them, but they're not that important because despite a 13 and eight record, his ERA that season uh, across 32 starts was 0.76. <laughs> and he, what he lost eight games. He, he lost, no, he lost 18 games, eight, 18 games, 13 <laughs> and 18. Okay. So <laughs> if you look across that, he pitched 298 innings. He gave up 144 runs, 25 of which were earned. (laughs) So the defense behind him, very sus. I guess. 
I he's not buying steak dinners for anybody out there <laughs> playing defense behind him. No, I played for a softball team that was very similar. Anyway, <laughs> so big league teams were anxious to get this guy on their roster, and he signed with Philadelphia. Now I have have written down here in my notes the Philadelphia Quackers, but I think it's probably the Quakers. Uh, probably <laughs> or the Quackers. I yeah. mean, come on, Could auto be auto correct. A duck nickname. <laughs> Regardless, did the Ducks sign him? Do you think maybe that Ducks grouped together and signed? I don't know. Are but, they any smarter than seagulls? Yes, seagulls. Oh, yeah, okay. Seagulls are dumb. Uh, regardless, after two appearances in two exhibition games, the Quakers released him. So maybe they were Quackers, Quacks to release somebody. <laughs> this, I mean, two exhibition games, and they're like, yeah, no. So the Crosstown Athletics picked him up. In his rookie season, he went 26 and 28 with a 4.27 ERA. To his credit, he did pitch 466 innings in the season. That's a lot. Nobody even pitches half of that anymore. No, no, that's amazing. And in something that would become a theme during his career, Gus led the league in hit batters with 37, and he uncorked 49 wild pitches, which, frankly, neither of those is going to help the old ERA because no. those are still earned runs uh, on, on both of those if they score. Uh, I want to highlight one start in particular in his rookie season. It's July 16th at St. Louis. While on the mound... A runaway team of horses ran onto the field at the end of the third inning. This story says that St. Louis first baseman and uh, later cheapskate owner of the Black Sox slash White Sox, Charles Comiskey, quote, daringly captured the horses and saved the carriage, end quote. (laughs) What? Wow. A lot of places where baseball was played at this point didn't have fences and there were no cars. And so people would just bring their horses and tie him up or not tie him up, I guess, in this case, and go stand in the outfield and watch the game or something. But now I can totally see this on like a Hollywood film. He's being dragged alongside this carriage. He pulls himself up by the reins of one of the horses as they tear around the field. And he he gets them to stop right before they run over a cliff. Yeah, it's some here go. by the baseball field with a baby sleeping soundly in the back, unaware of the danger. Right. That, there you go. That No, that, if it were Hollywood. Yeah. But more absolutely. likely, the the horses probably just kind of milled onto the outfield, probably eating grass, and stood there while Comiskey probably just grabbed the reins and slowly walked them back off the field. Yeah. But, but you're you're throwing cold water on a great uh, story, man. I know, but I'm just being... I, I want... I want our listeners to be able to hear the story that's told and then hear what probably happened. That's okay. what we do. All right. The next two seasons, Gus continued to hit batters and miss catchers at an alarming rate, but his ERA did shrink to 2.25 and 2.95. And he went a combined 58 and 39 over those two seasons, including a no hitter against the Kansas City Cowboys before jumping to the short lived Players League in 1890 where he went 30 and 16 and only hit 21 batters. Now, 21 batters, that's 16 fewer than his best season in the National League. So, I don't know were batters harder to hit in the players league or what? I don't I don't understand the correlation there. But maybe they bobbed and weaved better or something. Maybe you they were thinner. So, he that's had it. a smaller target. Then uh, tough times hit Gus unfortunately. His mother died followed just weeks later by his brother passing away. His brother, by the way, he also spent some time in the big leagues. These deaths hit Gus hard, and his personality changed a little bit. One of those instances where you could see he was a a different person, he was sitting in the stands watching his team play a game because he wasn't pitching that day, and he started to heckle the umpire and eventually got tossed from the stadium by the ump. He returned after the game, having spent the rest of the game at a bar and was arrested for using vile language in the presence of ladies, which oh. was apparently a punishable crime at the time. Well, as it should have been. <laughs> Think if we had that today with social media. Well, would just... well, <laughs> I've heard some ladies that could. Uh, oh, yeah. Cuss the wallpaper off a wall. I yeah. Mean, yeah. I, I, I think could they go get arrested for swearing in front of themselves. <laughs> I don't know. I You were the one that was like in school at this time, not me. <laughs> wow. Ouch. Yeah. But yeah, it's true. Just showing that baseball players have always been known to play practical jokes on each other. 
This is 1890, mind you, and while at a bar drinking with teammates, Gus was bet whether he could throw the sandwiches that the team were eating on specific parts of the ceiling of this bar, which happened to have hand-painted decorations on it. So I assume that Gus pretended the, the paintings that he was aiming at were batters because he hit them. They ended up with a, quote, huge plot of butter and mustard, end quote, on the ceiling. <laughs> That's, Which that's that's probably not the only time that happened there is what I'm thinking. <laughs> well, does this mean that they were eating mustard and butter sandwiches? Was that Ugh. a thing? I don't know. Yeah. His teammates, seeing the chance for a even greater prank on Gus, got together with a private investigator and had him arrested for this damage. He was uh, issued a phony arrest warrant by this private investigator and his teammates were given fake subpoenas to come and testify. The district's attorney office even played along with this Jeez. and had somebody, quote unquote, formally publicize the allegations against Gus. And he and the witnesses showed up at a local bar to testify. Now, I thought that the giveaway here for Gus would be that they needed to go to a bar to be deposed, but different times, I guess. maybe. Yeah, I, that would have struck me as abnormal. <laughs> so Gus was handed a one year prison term. By this, uh, by this fake judge, and he panicked, thinking that he was going to go to jail. And he, he's like, oh, "I'll pay whatever was done. I'll pay twice as much. Just I don't put me in jail." So he was finally let in on the joke, but was forced to pay the bar tab for the team and everybody involved at the bar that they were at. But this joke made its way back to the owner of the original bar where the paintings had been hit with the with the sandwiches. Gus was then for real charged with intentional mischief, which resulted in damage estimated at $200 and an actual arrest warrant for him was issued. But he had already taken off for Louisville for the off season, And yeah, he got away with it. That's hardly fair to charge a guy twice, even if one of them was a practical joke. I mean, what about double jeopardy? I don't, was that a thing back then? I don't know. I don't know what no, double no, jeopardy is. Like in the constitution, Never mind. It's all good. Oh, well, was the Constitution around in 1890? I'm not a political We were still scholar. voting on it. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> After the Players League folded, Gus returned to the American Association with the Athletics, posting a career-high 9.8 war for the season Ooh. and going 31-20 and 20 despite the familiar hit, batter, and wild pitch totals. This was the third of four consecutive seasons in which Gus would win 30 or more games. So, I mean, this guy's good. Following this season, this version of the Athletics folded and Gus was looking for a new team. But uh, until he was signed, he needed money to live on. So he turned to a life of crime. <laughs> so he, he, what you're saying is he hadn't built up any real uh, usable skills. Well, I, other yeah, he didn't have any money because he had to pay all these bar tabs for this joke that everybody was in on but him. Sure. But Gus, just like Mike Tyson, was a fan of pigeons. And uh, we'd talked about this one before. I don't remember in what context it came up, but he had entered several of his own pigeons in a Louisville pigeon show, which apparently was a thing. And as he was leaving the show with his birds, he saw a couple of other pigeons he liked. So he just took them, put them <laughs> in his basket, tried to walk off. Now, I really wish he'd been wearing a trench coat because it would have been good comedy. Not so much for the birds, but to like put them in inside pockets you know, yes. to kind of hide them. But regardless, he was caught trying to steal these wonderful pigeons. He was again arrested, but told the police that his name was William Joyce, who was a former teammate of his. My suspicions here are is that William Joyce was in on this original sandwich prank and uh, Gus was trying to get back at him by having him take the fall for the pigeons. I don't Definitely know. Definitely a possibility. Yeah. Just, just floating it. Uh, the case went to court, but the pigeons owner didn't bother to show up once he found out who had actually stolen the pigeons because he was a famous baseball player. <laughs> the case was dismissed <laughs> and he suffered no consequences for stealing birds or for telling the police that he was somebody else. Privilege. Yeah, uh, I guess so. Gus signed with the Phillies for the 1892 season. Apparently, he just wanted to stay in Philly and would sign with whatever team happened to be playing there that season. So now he's on the Phillies. We've already established that Gus likes pigeons, right? Birds right, of yeah. all sort, I'm sure, but he liked pigeons for sure. So he liked them so much that he had a coup 
a coup, a coop. What, what are the, I can't pronounce words it's a, today. It's a, I think the P is silent. A coup. I can pterodactyl. <laughs> All right. Well, he had a birdhouse, a big birdhouse. How about that? He had a big birdhouse built at the ballpark to, to house these things. But some of them went missing shortly after the circus pulled into town and mm. one of their snakes escaped its pen. Oh, Gus and teammate Lav Ross. Not Bob Ross, <laughs> Lav Vross, L-A-V-E, and the last name is V-R-O-S-S. I've, how many guys do you find with two V's in the Vross. name? Vross. Well, they found the snake, and they shot it. Apparently, <laughs> they shot it, a, like, a lot, like, too many times. It was already dead, and they just kept shooting, I think, because they were angry. But the snake was cut open, and several of their missing birds were found inside the stomach. Gus had the snake skin turned into shoes that he wore around, apparently as a warning to other snakes that were thinking about messing with his birds, is my guess. Yeah, that, that's definitely a sign. <laughs> then something happened uh, that changed Gus's career, and not for the better. Prior to the 1893 season, the National League abolished the pitcher's box, moving the pitcher from 50 feet back now to the standard 60 feet 6 inches. Despite being only 26 years old, Gus had a real hard time adjusting to this change. He spent time on three different teams that year, ineffective on all of them, including his hometown Louisville Colonels. And in an odd twist, we are mentioning the Louisville Colonels, but not mentioning Pete Brown, who was (laughs) never a teammate of Gus, if you can believe it. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. How does that not happen? I don't know. Uh, His season highlight, though, not a good season, obviously. Three different teams, not good with any of them. But his season highlight might have actually been when he got into a fist fight with umpire Fred Jane in a train car that was uh, headed to Louisville. Okay. Well, you know, if you can't win on the field. Yeah, do it. Uh, The rest of Gus's career in the major leagues looked a lot like Edwin Jackson's. Just team after team after team, often two or three in a season, but all with very little effectiveness. Essentially, he was just a body to fill out a rotation as needed. Gus's last full-time spot in baseball was 1903, but he resurfaced in 1910 in the Western Association as the manager of the Tulsa Producers. Beyond managing... Yeah, the Producers. I... Was it named after the Broadway show? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that, that's also a, a, a lot of stress put on me if you don't produce. Well, I assume, and, and here's just me being serious, Tulsa producers because, like, they produce oil in Tulsa, in Oklahoma. Was that really? Um, well, I mean, they could have produced runs. They could have been the Tulsa Tulsas, as Atlanta has <laughs> yes. shown us. Don't be the afraid. Atlantis. Don't be afraid to embrace the double name. But beyond managing, he apparently, Mark, dabbled in some scorekeeping and in-stadium production. Nice. This of interest to you and I. Gus is credited with innovating the displaying of National League, American League, and Western Association game scores in the ballpark, quote, as quickly as they can be bulletined, end quote. Which, in 1910, I don't know, maybe you, you got the score the next day. And they, I, it, maybe it wasn't the same. I don't know. But apparently he wanted to show scores from uh, other games and did so. So we have hmm. Gus to thank for out-of-town scores in stadiums and arenas today. That's awesome. Yeah. This innovation wasn't enough, though. He didn't last long there. Uh, the team actually went through three managers in the first two months of the season. So the producers, <laughs> I don't know what they're producing. I guess they're producing a lot of managers, but... He caught on as a player with another team in the league, the Galveston Sand Crabs, which I'm not going to have to go through and tell everybody it was not actually Sand Crabs that signed him. It was a team where he pitched two games before being released. The next day after being released, he applied to be an umpire in the league and debuted a month later. It didn't Hmm. go well. No. No. He was accused of again using coarse language and just of not being very good, which... I mean, Angel Hernandez would have had a much shorter career if these rules still applied in baseball today. But yeah, that's uh, not not being very good doesn't seem to stop a lot. of No, guys. certainly does not. Gus finally left baseball for good and found work at several odd jobs until he passed away in 1955. Now, a couple of closing notes about Gus and his place in baseball history. First of all, in January 1901, he married Mamie Gehrig. 
future cousin of Yankees future star Lou Gehrig, who was born two years later. Hmm. He should have taken his her last name. No kidding. It might have helped him a little bit down yeah, the road. That, that'll bump up the old batting average. <laughs> well, even though he's a, I think he had a 166 career batting average. So, I mean, really anything could have bumped yeah. up his career batting average. Uh, Gus remains the leader today in hit batsmen for his career with 277 ahead of second place Chick Frazier's 219. Now, interestingly enough, Chick was teammates with Gus during his rookie season in Louisville. Chick only hit 29 that year, but led the league in walks with 166 and 27 wild pitches. So very much in the same mold as Gus. I guess so. Yeah. Uh, The top five list of all-time hit batters by pitchers is rounded out actually by two Hall of Famers. Fourth is Walter Johnson with 205, and fifth is the big unit, Randy Johnson with 190. Wow. Yeah, that's 190 painful hit by pitches. Yeah, I think like three-quarters of those were from his first couple of seasons with the Mariners. Yeah. I, yeah. I I looked it up actually as I was as I was putting this together and yeah Randy was very wild uh, his first couple of years in Seattle and he then was. he got control but then later on in his career he hit the same amount as he did in those first couple of years. Well, that's the difference was it was unintentional the first couple of years. Yeah, well, too I I think he was just getting older too. He probably didn't mean hit everybody, but he may have. Yeah, he, he might have. In 2016, James Shields of the White Sox became the first pitcher since Gus in 1895 to allow seven plus runs in the first three innings of a game six times in one season. Wow. So big ups to big, big game James on that one. That's boy, I guess one to hang on the mantle. Uh, Gus is seventh on the all time list for errors by a pitcher with 128. But it should be noted that Gus was the last major league pitcher to play without a fielding glove. Huh? Which I I don't know. Is that really going to affect your fielding? Because you're just not going to it's just going to go right past you. You're not going to touch it. Right. I mean, a lot of pitchers like myself just knock the ball down with any body part you can throw in front of it. So glove, not necessarily, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Useful. 128. Greg Maddox is, is weeping quietly in the corner hearing that. But yeah. He is also fifth all time with 240 wild pitches, 10th with 1,570 walks, and seventh having allowed 1,872 earned runs. Despite those records, he finished his 14-year big league career with 540 games pitched, 505 of those were starts, a career 264 and 232 record, a career ERA of 3.88. He had 28 shutouts and get this, only four box. (laughs) (laughs) If Bob Davidson would have been around. (laughs) Bach and Bob. Bach and Bob. Uh, Overall, that's a war of 47.7. For Gus, for his career, that is the exact same as Hall of Famer A.D. Joss, who, wow. to be career, A.D. played a lot less and was a lot better than Gus. It's, it's just comparing him to a Hall of Famer. But that is the story of Gus weighing the, uh, the pigeon aficionado. <laughs> All right. Very nice. Mark, that's going to wrap up the first part of the show. It is now time that we head into the final segment of the show. And let's get on into, uh, what do we call it? Oh, yeah, Wax Packs Hero. Wax Pack Hero! Gotta pull the Wax Pack Hero! All right, Mark, looking at the scoreboard, we're getting serious now. The score is 11 to 9. I am ahead. We're playing first to 20. It was like 11 to 7 just a couple of weeks ago, and we have really kind of lost our our, our way here, and you've won a couple. But we're going to get back on it. But before we do, let us first go over the rules. If you are new here, we're going to open up some packs of old baseball cards. In this case, we are going to open up some... What did I say they were? 1989 tops, which these are different 89 tops because they're bigger than usual. And I don't know why, but we're going to open these up. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to play like the old card game of war 
uh, with baseball cards. The way we're going to do that is we are going to each throw down a card and we're going to look at the player's baseball reference war of that year. In this case, it would be 1989. Whoever has the highest war wins that round. But there are a couple of things that can either add or subtract from that score. Anything that falls within the umbrella of 80s baseball aesthetics. So that means real stirrups where we can see sanitary socks, uh, flip down sunglasses, big like science teacher sunglasses, mustaches, eye black, All of those are a tenth of a point extra. If they've got a really good mustache, we'll even give you a bonus, uh, you know, tenth of a point. So it'd be two tenths of a point. If we see things like two and ones uh, or stuff like that that we don't like, it is a minus a tenth of a point. If the player won any awards that year, like Rookie of the Year, Cy Young, MVP, or All-Star, or won a gold glove, that is a half a point for each of those. If there's a Hall of Famer on the card, whether they're the focus or not, that is a whole extra point. And if Ricky Henderson shows up in uh, either, you know, Mark or Mai's hand, I automatically win that round. And if Nolan shows up, Mark automatically wins that round. Any easily found pop culture references are a half a point each, unless they appeared on Seinfeld, The Simpsons, or Sabrina the Teenage Witch. You get a whole point for each of those. And if they were suspended or appeared in the Mitchell Report during their career, that is a minus a half a point. So, Mark, I've got these... Two uh, packs here of these 89 big tops. I've got one on my left, one on my right. I'm going to let you choose which one you want. Well, you, you know, the lately the right's been working for me, going with the right side, because you always pick the left side. So I will go right and try and keep that, uh, that winning streak going. All right. Remember, I took right last week and lost. So, we'll, well uh, you know, I, I didn't remember that. <laughs> but, uh, okay, then. All right. Well, here is a card famously traded for John Smoltz. It is pitcher for the Detroit Tigers, Doyle Alexander. Doyle Uh, Lafayette Alexander. Oh, wow. That is very regal. Isn't it? Yeah. Let's see. Overall, 19 years in the big leagues. He played for a lot of teams, mainly Baltimore for five years, then everybody else four or less as you go down the line there. 1989. Well, not great news for you. It was his final year in the big leagues. He was an Mm -hmm. all-star the year prior. But this year, in 33 games, he went 6-18, and 18, like a Gus Wayne type wow. of season there, uh, with a 4.44 ERA, led the league in uh, home runs allowed with 23, pitched 223 innings, gave up 245 hits, struck out 95, and that is an ERA plus of 87. And that will lead to a war of 1.7. Still. With all that, it's wow, still a positive. 18 losses. Yeah. And, you know, props to baseball reference. I mentioned this last week. They have now moved war for pitchers onto the main pitching column here, too. So thank oh, okay, you for that. Okay. Uh, all right. So that's a 1.7. Let's look at the card and see if there's anything else here. So these cards, since they're a little bit bigger, there's like a bust shot of the pitcher and then an action shot behind them. But it's from the waist up. And nothing on this card is going to help you out. There are little uh, cartoons on the back, which oh, nice. are not funny. Um, <laughs> I don't <laughs> so know. They're like Bazooka Joe. Yeah, okay. exactly. I'm not sure if they're supposed to be funny other than just showing you facts in cartoon form, I guess. But yeah, uh, it's, this is interesting. In, in his Wikipedia page, it says his performance declined in 1989 in part due to pitching with a fractured jaw. Hmm. Why was he pitching with his jaw? I know, and if you if you do pitch with your jaw and it's fractured, wouldn't you want it to heal before you pitched any more? Yeah, you would think. Well, that's uh, I would probably lose eighteen games minimum. <laughs> I could lose eighteen games without even a broken jaw. I can. <laughs> yes. I can do that. Oh, he was also traded by Toronto to Atlanta for Dwayne Ward. Hmm. He was traded like just straight up for some really good players. When Alexander negotiated his contract with the Blue Jays, the team refused to pay Alexander if he injured himself while hunting. (laughs) But they worked out a compromise that uh, he would collect money if he was hurt only if he was following all hunting regulations and wearing a hunting orange, you know, high-vis jacket. (laughs) Okay. So, all right. So uh, He was was dealt, looks like, straight up for um, John Smoltz. Yeah, I covered that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that, that's. I, I thought it might have been a package deal. Uh, I think. I think the Braves might have gotten a better piece of that trade. <laughs> Do you think? I don't know. <laughs> we'll let it play out and just see how it goes. All right. So you've got a one point seven, and you are going to be going up against mine. Now this is 
this is interesting because he might have not made the big leagues yet. It's Andy Bennis. Hmm. And this card is a Team USA card. So he's on the front. And then in the back, they've got uh, the team. It appears they've just won something and they're all holding up the American flag. Yeah, there's more cartoons on the back, but we won't go through those. So uh, I have got Andy Bennis. Let's take a look at Andy. Well, good news for me. That was his rookie year. We'll see if that is good or not. He did receive Rookie of the Year votes. Overall, in 10 games, he went 6-3. and three. So, wow, nine decisions in those 10 starts. 66 innings pitch, 51 hits allowed, 66 strikeouts. I like where this is going. Wow. Uh, a 100 even ERA plus, and that is a war of 1.0. So, I don't like where this is going. <laughs> How does that happen? I need to. Oh, I forgot. Doyle Alexander does have a mustache here in your picture. I don't know how I missed that. Oh, sure. So that'll be you're actually at a one point eight and I am at a one point zero and just praying for some stuff that we don't know about. Overall, a first round draft pick by the Padres in the 88 draft and not a lot else there. I, Let's I remember when he was dealt to the Mariners. It was a huge deal because it was the first time the Mariners had actually got went out and got somebody with a name, you know, in, in order to try and make the playoffs in, in 95. I remember that because it was Mark Newfield and Ron Valone that, that got dealt. And uh, I remember thinking, man, they got rid of Mark Newfield. That's terrible. But it, it ended up being okay. I think he won. It was 7-2. and two, But he didn't pitch well in the playoffs. So. But oh well. Well, not a lot pop culture to talk about. But this is interesting. One of the things that we talked about last week where Bennis had the habit of gritting his teeth when preparing to throw a slider that uh, uh, yeah, hitters would catch right. up on. So, all right. Well, good for you. You're up one to nothing. All right. Uh, next, you have got for the Toronto Blue Jays, it is George Bell. Ding dong bell. All right. If he played in Philadelphia, he would have probably been the Liberty Bell, I'm guessing. <laughs> But, oh, nicknames, Liberty. Look at that. He didn't even play in Philadelphia. There you go. Uh, overall, 12 years in the big leagues, nine with Toronto, two with the White Sox, one with the Cubs. 1989, let's see, he hit 297, 330 on base, 18 home runs, 104 RBI, and led the league with 14 sacrifice flies and a OPS plus of 126. He came in fourth in MVP balloting, and that is good for a war of 3.0. He does have a mustache here, and he does have real stirrups on. So nice. that'll be a 3.2. Now, the down part of these uh, cards is that the shot behind the bust is always so far away, it's kind of hard. Like, I can't tell if he's got eye black or a... Uh, you know, those kind of things on right, it. So, right. Oh, here, here's a cartoon that actually has some information. Has hit two home runs over the left field roof at Comiskey Park. Hmm. And his brother plays in the Dodgers chain, it says. 265 career home runs, over 1,000 runs batted in. Only a 316 on base percentage and a 469 slugging. Although he uh, was a better fielder than apparently we gave him credit for. Hmm. How about this? Uh, Bell became the first player in Major League history, the first player, I say, to hit three home runs on opening day, all coming off our guy, Brett Saberhagen. Oops. Probably too busy trying to come up with his next hit record. <laughs> yes. Oh, the fans got on him at one point for uh, committing an error, and he told the media that the fans could, quote, kiss my purple butt, end quote. <laughs> what is going on with butt? his butt if it's purple? You should have yeah. the trainer look at that immediately. Yeah, that's uh, you don't want to have a purple butt. I don't think. No, and you know who the uh, who the longtime play by play announcer was for the Blue Jays at that point, Tom Cheek. <laughs> okay, well, there that somehow fits. I can't figure out a way to make it work in one sentence, but yeah. I, I liked where you're going with that. <laughs> All right, so you got a three point two, and. Well, I like this guy. I don't I don't know that he's going to be able to beat a 3.2. Here he is with the Cardinals, Tom Brunanski. I remember Brunanski as as a Minnesota Twin. Also. Yeah, cuz he was on those Twins team, they like the 87 Twins team, I think. Yeah, he was on the Twins in 87 when they won the World Series. I definitely remember him there as well. Overall 14 years in the big league, 7 with the Twins, 4 with Boston, then St. Louis, Milwaukee, and California in 1989 with St. Louis. 
239 batting average, a 312 on base, 20 home runs, 85 RBI, and a 103 OPS plus. That is good for a 1.7 war. He didn't do great in that 87 World Series, but he tore it up against Detroit in the ALCS before that. Mm. He had 412 in five games, including wow. two home runs and nine RBI. Nice. Was, wow. I, I wonder if he was the MVP of that. ALCS. It doesn't tell me if he was or not. First round draft pick by the Angels in 1978 and was once traded straight up for Lee Smith. But that's probably not as important as the time he was traded straight up for Dave Valley. Wow. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I love Dave Valley. Dave. That's awesome. It's uh, interesting. Bernanski became a fixture in right field for the Twins through the 87 season. He became the f- only twin in franchise history to hit an inside the park grand slam. Mm. Everybody's got a hustle on those. Yeah, Dan Wilson, uh, yeah. speaking of Mariners catchers, he had an inside the park grand slam. And nothing else is going to add on to that. So unfortunately, that round likewise goes to you. I'm, I don't know, man. We've, we've, we might need a managerial change if this keeps up. All right, your next card here with the Chicago White Sox in these awesome uniforms that their jersey number is on their left thigh as well, on their (laughs) pants. It's Dan Pasqua. Dan Pasqua, yeah, boy, that's a name I haven't heard in a while. What is? I just want to know what is the what is the thought process behind putting the jersey number on the thigh of the pants. You got me on that one, man. I don't know. Let's see. Overall, Pasqua, 10 years in the big league, seven with the White Sox, three with the Yankees. I know he was there when Ricky was in New York. Let's see. In 1989 with the White Sox, 248 average, 315 on base, 11 home runs, 47 RBI, and a 111 OPS plus for a war of 1.1. Well, at least it's a positive. Yeah. Now, looking at this, well, I'm going to give you a tenth of a point for having his jersey number on his thigh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with that one. That's, that uh, is definitely an 80s baseball aesthetic right there. Yeah, for we, sure. We, that'll bring you up to 1.2 just off the card itself. This is this is kind of awesome. Former high school classmate of Pasco was sentenced to six months in jail for impersonating Pasco in order to swindle two women out of a combined $8,000. Okay. That's, uh, I think that's a law in, in a couple of states is impersonating Dan Pasqua. You can't <laughs> be doing that. Well, at one point, the Expos tried to trade Andre Dawson for Dan Pasqua. <laughs> and were rebuffed. <laughs> they were rebuffed is what, no, rebuked is what it says. Wow. But I think that might have been a mistake <laughs> by somebody. <laughs> wow, man. The I Hawk guess. straight up for, for Dan, Dan Pasqua. Pasqua. Yeah. yeah. Believe it or not, no uh, no pop culture references. Yeah. Uh, well, I got a shot here. Who, who, who do you have, man? All right. So uh, you've got a 1.2 and going up. Oh, well, I think, I, I think I'm going to take this one because I got a Hall of Famer. Oh, well, yeah, there you go. Second baseman for the Cubs. None other than Spokangelo's native Ryan Sandberg. Rhino. All right. Let's see. Uh, Rhino overall, 16 years in the big leagues. 15 with the Cubs and <laughs> one 13 game season when he came up in 81 with the Phillies. Yeah, that's uh that was a mistake. I, I'm just going to I'm just going to say it. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the Phillies made a mistake there. 1989 led the league in uh, runs scored with 104. Only five triples. Did a little bit short of his 84 uh, total of 19 triples. Hit 290, 356 on base, 30 home runs, 76 RBI, a 134 OPS plus. He came in fourth in all-star balloting, was an all-star and won a gold glove and had a 6.1 war for that season. Also on the card, he's got real stirrups and he has got a pullover jersey which uh, I think we should call an 80s baseball aesthetic. but For sure, absolutely. None of this matters, as I have obliterated Dan Pasqua. <laughs> Poor Dan Pasqua. Traded by the Phillies with Larry Boa to the Cubs for Yvonne de Jesus. I think Yvonne de Jesus is who I was confusing with Yvonne Calderon last week. Oh, sure. I got my Yvonnes uh, mixed up. Well, there's so many of them. Uh, yeah, I mean, except for uh, Pudge, that's the only other Avon I can think of. Yeah. Rhino has uh, been in some things, I think. I think we've talked about it, but we've talked about him 
enough, and that's a big enough win that uh, we're going to move on. It is now two to one. Your next card is another catcher. It is here, and I think of him as a cub when I think of him, but here he is with Atlanta. It is Jody Davis. Oh, okay. I don't think we've ever had Jody Davis in Wax Pack. I don't think so either, yeah. Welcome, Jody. <laughs> Welcome to Wax Packs. Welcome uh, to, to our show. Uh, let's see, overall, 10 years in the big leagues, eight with Chicago, and then f- the, the final three were in Atlanta. 1989. Uh, he was a backup catcher, 78 games. Uh, he hit 169 at 246 on base, four home runs, 19 RBI, and a 40 OPS plus for a war of minus 0.1. Nice. Or I'm not, uh, no, that's just a minus one. <laughs> that's not even a minus 0.1. That is a minus 1.0. Now, on the card, this is a great shot. It's at Riverfront Stadium. And it's between innings, and he is not catching this game, but he's warming up the pitcher in between innings. He's out there with his glove and his squat, but no catcher's gear on. Mm. It's a good shot, and you can see he's got real stirrups. You got that going for you at least. Okay, well, there's something. Yeah. Um, let's see. Jody Davis, a good good defensive catcher, was replaced by rookie Damon Berryhill, my guy in Chicago. Uh, the well, last note here on, on Jody Davis, second cousin of former major league pitcher Wade Davis. Okay. So another cousin, but all right, you've got Jody Davis, a minus 0.9. Yes. Oh, I don't know. This is going to be close. I have got, uh, I think he's an outfielder for Cleveland, Carmen Castillo. Hmm. So let's see. Carmen, 10 years in the big league, seven with Cleveland, three with Minnesota. 1989 was his first year in Minnesota. Let's see a 257 average, 305 on base, eight home runs, 33 RBI, a 106 OPS plus, and a war of minus 0.5. <laughs> now, the good news for me is I can see he's got eye black on, but more than that, in this bust picture, he has got a batting helmet with no ear flaps. Oh, nice. We like that. So that will uh, take me to a minus point three, but we're not done yet. He might have been suspended. We don't know. We'll have to check it out here. I don't that would think- be the worst use of a suspension ever. <laughs> I'm not sure suspending him is going to really hurt anybody at this point. No, but nothing else here to really talk about. But the good news for me is that is a, a win in that round. Uh, Carmen takes down Jody Davis. All right. Uh, your next card is a pitcher for the San Diego Padres, Eric Shaw. Eric, win, place, or Shaw? Mm, or really, really big Shaw? Yeah, that could work too. Isn't somebody else's nickname do the really, really big? Rick Shu. My guy. Uh, Eric let's, Shaw, we should, I should get mustache points here. Yeah, he's definitely got a mustache. Let's see, 11 years in the big leagues, 10 with San Diego, and then a final one with Oakland in 1991. 1989, he went 8-6 and six with the Padres, a 4-2-3 ERA, 106 innings pitch, 113 hits, 66 strikeouts, and 83 ERA plus. And that is good for a .4 war. So it's in the positive. I'll take positive. That's good. Now, it was Shao, right, that gave up Pete Rose's record-breaking 4,192nd career hit in Cincinnati and unfortunately passed away in 1994. He had a lot of problems with substance abuse. Yes. uh, Said story off the field. Now, what I don't like about Eric Shao is he got in a shoving match with left fielder Carmelo Martinez at one point, thinking Mm. that Carmelo wasn't hustling. Ooh. I mean, you don't mess with my guy, Camelo, Camelo, yeah, Camelo. His former show guest, Dave Dravecki, delivered the eulogy at Eric Chow's funeral. Oh, I bet he was in that God Squad with Dravecki that he talked about when we talked to him. Yeah, maybe. All right. So uh, you've got a point four. Oh, you got a, and the mustache. You got a point point five there. I'm tempted to maybe give you another one because he's got a button down jersey and he's got it buttoned down below the below where it says Padres, which is, oh, yes. I think, very cool. And that's how I wear my uniform, even though I am not big enough to really look cool doing that. I do that because I remember, I mean, that's the way the A's wore because they were all so big, and I thought that that was cool looking. But, yeah, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you because I can see who my next card is. 
<laughs> That's fair. So I'll give you, you're at one even there for Eric Shaw. And I have got local boy here from my neck of the woods. It is Willie McGee here with the Cardinals. Yeah, I think you might have me here. Willie, his name is Willie, not William. Willie Dean McGee, born in San Francisco. There you go. Overall, 18 years in the big leagues, 13 with the Cardinals, four with the Giants, and then one apiece for Boston and Oakland. 1989 with St. Louis. I'm going to go ahead and just right now take back that 10th of the point I gave you. <laughs> Willie was hurt this year. He only appeared Uh-oh. in 58 games, 236 average, 275 on base, three home runs, 17 RBI, and he was he had eight stolen bases, six caught stealing. I'm assuming something was wrong with the leg if Willie McGee's yeah. getting thrown out that much. 76 OPS plus for a .1 war. Ouch. Unfortunately, he has got two and ones, but he has also got a mustache and he's got a batting helmet with two ear flaps on it. Oh, sweet. But I only get one of those. So that'll take me to point two. I'm not sure. Oh, I know. Didn't he host that show with with Ozzy Smith and they dressed up as old people? Pretty sure they did. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, let's see. Before we get to that first round draft pick, 15th overall by the Yankees in 1977. And then they traded him to St. Louis for Bob Sykes. They're trading Willie McGee. They're trading Fred McGriff. Like, there's some bad trades here by St. Louis. Man, no kidding. Yeah, one's hit for the cycle. Two batting titles. He's in the Cards Hall of Fame, won three gold gloves. He was an MVP. MVP in 85. Yeah, 85 MVP. 8.2 war. Led the league with 216 hits, wow. 18 triples, and stole wow. 56 bases. That was when he led the league with a 353 average. Only a 384 on base, though. Like, he didn't walk. He just hit. Yeah. But when you hit 353. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess that's so. That's okay. A couple of gold gloves as well. None of which were this year. Uh, even with even with the uh, the show that he did with Ozzy Smith, not enough, and you're going to get the win there. Shao beats McGee. I, I felt <laughs> confident there. All right, it's three to two. Next, you've got catcher for the Expos, Nelson Santavenia. Nelson Santavenia. Not much reference here uh, to Nelson. No? Well, he mm. spent seven years in the big leagues, five with Montreal, and then parts of the season with Kansas City and the White Sox. Let's see, in 1989, 97 games for the Expos, hit 250, 307 on base, five home runs, 31 RBI, and a 88 OPS plus. But that is good for a 1.5 war. Wow. Okay, I didn't expect that. First round draft pick by Montreal in 1982. When Vince Coleman stole 50 consecutive bases, it was Centavinia who caught him before he could steal 51. So there you go. There's his claim to fame. I think that's that's about it, though. Yeah, uh, that's about it. He does have a mustache, and I'm going to give you uh, a 80s aesthetic because he's wearing those Expos. He's got an Expos batting helmet on, the pinwheel, tricolor. Oh, sweet. Thing going on there. So that'll be a 1.7 for you. And I've got one of my favorite guys, though I don't know that he's going to beat Nelson Santavena. Uh, I've got Chico, Jose Lind. Oh, Yes. Let's see, Chico, nine years in the big league, six with Pittsburgh, three with Kansas City, and then one with uh, California. 1989 with Pittsburgh, 153 games. He hit 232, a 280 on base percentage, two home <laughs> runs, 48 RBI, 15 stolen bases, only caught once. But that is a 67 OPS plus. He was a he was an all glove guy, but still, that is a war of minus point one. Nice. <laughs> wah, wah. I'm not really doing well here. Now, it's interesting here because on his baseball reference, the last time he appeared in the big leagues was 1995. And then it's got 96, 97, and 98 listed as did not play. Interesting. Yeah, I I think he got in some trouble with the law. Well, and, and it looks like then in 1999, he played in the Atlantic League, the Independent League, for the Bridgeport Bluefish for four years. Hmm. The, those are the bluefish, not the billfish that we learned right, about. Right. I don't think this is going to matter. I mean, I, this is a good card. I mean, he's got a mustache. He's got real stirrups on and he's got eye black, but I, I don't think it's going to matter. And yeah, I uh, got in trouble with the law. Spent some time in the can. Do people still call yeah. it that the can? Uh, well, you can refer to a few things, a few places as the can. Like uh, George, it was a George Bell's purple butt. 
<laughs> you can find that in the can on occasion, I imagine. <laughs> All right. So that's another win for you. You are up four to two. And you have got here kind of a utility guy for Texas, for the Rangers. It's Scott Fletcher. Is this the uh, George Bush dog guy? No. Is that him? Might be. Overall, 15 years in the big league, six with the White Sox, four with the Rangers, and then Boston, the Cubs, the Brewers, and the Tigers for a little bits of time. In 1989, he split team. He split time between Texas and Chicago, the White Sox. And let's see, overall hit 253, a 332 on base, one home run, 43 RBI, and an 83 OPS plus for a war of 1.8. That seems to be like your sweet spot today, right it around. Kind of is, yeah. One point something. Let's see. On the card, he's got eye black. I can see that. I can't tell if those are real stirrups or not, so I can't make a call on that. First round draft pick three different times. Wow. Once by the A's, didn't sign. Once by the Astros, didn't sign. And then finally, as the sixth pick overall in the 79 draft by the Cubs, he signed there. Traded at one point for Harold Baines. Hmm. He was traded with Wilson Alvarez and Sammy Sosa to the White Sox for Harold Baines and Fred Manrique. And yeah, the uh, George W. had a had a dog named Fletcher. Spot Fletcher. Spot Fletcher. Is that is a spot starter as well? That's right. All right. So that will be a 1.9 for you. My last chance here is, is with somebody that we don't talk about on this show. It is Lenny Dykstra. Oops. He had some good years, though. He could pull you off. I'm uh, not sure that 1989 was one of them. Probably I, not. Well, I guess he was on the Phillies at that point. Yeah, he, he was a Phil, yeah. <laughs> he probably was doing all right. Let's see. 12 years in the big leagues, eight with the Phillies, five with the Mets. Let's see. 1989, he was traded from the Mets to the Phillies. Overall, a 237 average, 318 on base, seven home runs, 32 RBI, 30 stolen bases, a 90 OPS plus, And that is good for a war of 2.4. Now, he does have real stirrups on here, and he has got the pullover jersey. So that will be a 2.6, but we've got to get into things that might knock him down as well. Yeah, there's a handful. (laughs) Uh, The visual report being one. Well, all right. So that will take me down to a 2.1 compared to your 1.9 right off the bat. Wow. Anything else that's going to hurt him? Let's see. Legal issues. Well, we know all about that. Purchased Wayne Gretzky's estate for $17 million, hoping to flip it. Do you flip (laughs) houses that are $17 million? I don't know. Uh, In 99, he had a little bit of a run-in that was not good uh, with the law. Well, I mean, he began a a high-end jet charter company and magazine. Do those usually go together? Uh, high-end jet charter magazine or uh, charter company and magazine marketed mm-hmm. to professional athletes known as the players club. I mm-hmm. imagine that was not successful. <laughs> Bounced checks, credit card fraud. We know we can say whatever we want about him. He can't, he can't sue us. Was a regular on Howard Stern and has written a book. Oh boy. That 99. <laughs> yeah, that's trouble not was not good at all. Oh boy. I mean, his section here called legal issues is longer than like, I think Ricky Henderson's whole Wikipedia page. It's, it is ridiculous. <laughs> it goes on and on. Oh boy. boy. <laughs> well, if you're listening to us in Scranton or wilkes Bear, good news for you. That's where Lenny apparently lives now. Had a stroke last year. I see a lot of stuff here. We can, we nick him for the, the Mitchell report, but I, the rest of this is, we either take all his points or we don't take any more. What do you think? <laughs> I think I think uh, we dinged him for the Mitchell report. All right. I'll take the win with Lenny Dykstra. Ah, okay. So uh, here we go. It's four to three. We're getting down to it here. You have got my, uh, my favorite Royal pitcher of all time. We've talked about him earlier. We talked about him last week. Last week, we even played his hit rap song. It's Brett Sabrahagan. There you go. Wow, so uh, I'm going to get pop culture points. Yeah, you got uh, you got pop culture points right away. You got a mustache. You got real stirrups. Let's see, 16 years in the big leagues. Kansas City for eight. Mets, Boston for four. And then Colorado for one. 1989, wow, Cy Young year. 
Okay. <laughs> Second of, of two. Led the league in war, wins, ERA, complete games, innings pitched, ERA plus, FIP, and WHIP. Yes. Won a gold glove and came in eighth in MVP voting as well. I mean, this is a 9.7 war. <laughs> so, wow. I mean, we've talked about say Reagan quite a bit so we're not going to go through anything else uh, just knowing that you've got over a 10 point war season I think will do it as my card is is a guy I like but uh, I don't think Kevin Mitchell's gonna gonna break the 10 war barrier not, although he, he sure could hit yeah good power let's see nicknamed world Mitchell monster boogie bear and Tatanka but you know I say that in 1989 he Won the MVP award in the oh National my. League. It was also an all-star and led the league in home runs, RBI, slugging, on-base, OPS, OPS+, plus, and total bases, as well as intentional walks. So he hit 291 with a 388 on base, 47 home runs, 125 RBI, a 192 OPS+, plus for a 6.9 war. But even with the the MVP and the All Star, that's a seven point nine. He does have a mustache and real stirrups, so that'll be an eight point one. And you know, I'm still two whole points behind you. Yeah, I, I uh, did all right drawing the old Saberhagen card there. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm afraid that nothing I'm going to be able to do. He was traded with a lot of big names, or for a lot of big names as well, but. That's not going to help me. And now you have crept within one win of me. It is 10 to 11. And uh, I'm going to have to have a meeting with the owner after this game. (laughs) Closed door meeting time. Uh, Yeah. But I mean, you can't fire the players. So I'm probably going to be the one that takes the hit here on this one. But (laughs) all right. That'll do it for another edition of Wax Packs Heroes. Thank you for uh, joining us. That's also going to wrap up our uh, show for this week. If you want more of us, you can find us on all the social medias. All the links are in the show notes or just do a Google search for Two Strike Noise. That's T-W-O Strike Noise. Be sure to check out our Blue Sky page as well as YouTube and Twitch. We're on there a couple of times a week. And uh, we also have an email address that Mark was going to tell you about. Sure, you can write us with your angry comments at uh, Two Strike Noise. Spell it out, T-W-O Strike Noise at gmail.com. I'm glad they're angry because you're the uh, you're the gatekeeper of that one. Well, so. I don't show you those ones, man. <laughs> they're probably all about <laughs> me too, huh? Well, I'll take what I can get. Uh, it's engagement. That's what it is. There but you go. That'll do it for this week's episode. We will see you again next week on another episode of Two Strike Noise. Thank you. God bless you. Have a great day.